I'm not a public speaker, folks, but I know my dad pretty good. And I know the Bible. I know Jesus personally. And my dad's well taken care of, I can tell you that. We used to read the Bible. We read the Bible at our house every day. We'd come over there and we'd read. So he knows. I tell you, you know, can you guys hear me? Test, test. I got my notes but I'm not reading them because I do better without notes. Uh, the reason we have these gatherings, folks, I'm not a funeral guy. I hate going to funerals. I usually don't go to them, and I'm sure you know who likes going to a funeral. And uh, another person that never liked funerals was Jesus. In fact, if he was ever at one, he just brought the person that died and brought him back to life. You can read about that in the Bible yourself. Uh, in fact, one time he even delayed going to a guy's Funeral and came later intentionally, Lazarus, John chapter 11. But anyway, the reason we have these things, you got to go back to the beginning of the word. So just bear with me. Let me just explain it a little bit. God's plan. He's got a plan in place, folks. A lot of people can go to church all their life and not realize the plan that the Lord has. And he's got a plan for us. And it started off how he did everything in six days, and then he rested. And he sanctified that day, that rest day for him. Jesus, God the Father, and Jesus who was with him in the beginning. They rested that seventh day and blessed it and sanctified it and said it shall be a Sabbath day forever. Anyway, after the rest day, that's when he formed us from the dust of the earth. He formed Adam and Eve. And he put them in the Garden of Eden. You know that. And then he told them, you can eat of any tree you want in this garden except one. He says, do not eat it of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because if you do, you shall die. And from the dust I formed you, from the dust you shall return. Well, you know what happened? The serpent was in there, which is actually Satan, who was, in the Bible, he was one of God's top cherubim angels, cherubim angels, but he was cast out of heaven before Adam and Eve were formed. Uh, we don't have too much information on that, but that's what the Bible says. Anyway, the serpent was there, and he got to Eve and says, hey, why don't you want to eat of this tree? And Eve says, oh, we're not supposed to eat of that tree or, nor touch it. And this, and this serpent says, well, you can eat of the tree. God just doesn't want you to know what he knows. You can eat of it. So Eve falls for the lie. And she takes the fruit of the tree, and she gives it to Adam, and Adam eats it too. You know, following his wife, not without thinking. Anyway, the Lord then shows up by these two guys, to, by Adam and Eve, and says, Adam, where are you? They were naked, but they knew they were naked then. Anyway, the Lord says, Adam, I told you, if you eat of that tree the consequences you're going to face. And now from the dust I formed you, from the dust you shall return. And the Lord, he also cursed the earth. The earth is that's where we have thorns and thistles and, and uh, weeds and, and storms and a lot of things. And then he says, women will have pain in childbearing. That's why women have pain in childbearing. That came right from the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve ate of the wrong tree. You can read it yourself, Genesis chapter 2 and 3. And then he even cursed Satan, who was the serpent of old, and says, from the dust you shall crawl the rest of your life, which means Satan lost his heavenly authority, but he's running around here on earth, and he's trying to confuse a lot of us as, as best he can. But anyway, the plan was, that's why we have what we call death, because of what happened there. The Lord said, from the dust I form you, from the dust you shall return. These bodies. But, he also said, he'll send the seed through the woman, which was his son Jesus who came through the woman, and he says, he shall come, and he'll crush that serpent's head. He said, the serpent will bruise his heel, which happened at the cross with Jesus. But Jesus now has power and authority over Satan and over evil and over death and over sin. And Jesus has got our sin covered through his blood atonement for us, and he's got death conquered, so we don't have to die. Jesus says, you believe and trust in me? He goes, you'll never die or see death. Now, these bodies still have to go back to the dust. You know, but he's got new glorified bodies waiting for us. 
better materials than these. And Jesus showed what that can do when he came back after the resurrection, when he appeared to many people for up to 40 days. They thought you were seeing a ghost a lot of times, but he would come in physical presence and said, does the ghost have bones and flesh? And then he'd sit down and eat in front of them, and, but then he'd just disappear. Uh, amazing. But that's, those are the kind of bodies that we're going to have. Still male and still female. A lot of people don't realize that, too. Still fully male, fully female. The Bible gets into even the body parts, the members, Psalm 139, Song of Solomon. And Jesus also said, every hair in her head is numbered. So anybody lost any hair, them hairs are all coming back. <laughs> and you can maybe even ask the Lord to maybe take some hairs where you don't want them and put them where you do want them. You know, he can do all that stuff. They're all numbered. You just might say, yeah, I'll take this number, that number, and we'll put it over here. Anyway, that's why we have these funerals. But the good news is Jesus has got death conquered. My dad know, knows that. I hope you people know that. And, and he wants us to stay of good cheer and not to get down in his funerals. People that don't know the Lord, it can be tough on funerals. But when you know the Lord, it's actually a, it can be a happy time because we know who's got the power and authority over death and who's got us covered and where we're going. You know, how many people say, oh, they're in a better place? Well, I always say, well, where is this better place? Well, I, I, there's two places that I know of what the Bible talks about. One's up in heaven and one's down where you don't want to be. It doesn't say that everybody just goes up. Jesus says he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through him. If you know the Lord, you know you're going up. So hopefully all you guys and your family members get to know the Lord. You know, a lot of people don't have all the knowledge. You know, you don't have to understand everything. He doesn't expect that, but just to let him know that you believe and trust him, even if you don't understand it. He'll, he'll guide you, and, and, and you'll have peace in your heart and so on. He'll be there in ways that you don't even imagine. Anyway, I'll go back to my dad here now. Uh, when he was a little kid, his dad, who taught him the truth of the Bible, actually his dad, my grandpa, also taught me when I was a little kid how to get on my knees and talk to God the Father and the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit. He set that foundation in me, too. My mom had me going to church after that. I was kind of bored in church, but Jesus taught me later was through his word. I got a whole testimony on that. But my dad used to sing gospel songs when we were little kids with uh, his brothers and, and his dad. In fact, is L Lloyd here? Yeah. Lloyd's my uncle. There he is. My dad's brother, Lloyd, folks. 91? 91 years old, Lloyd. I was going to say, I, I, this thing called what he's seen in his lifetime here. Great guy. We got a lot of stories of Lloyd too. But these Lloyd will testify. These guys sang gospel songs, uh, on, on, even on the radio, different places, and and, uh, and then even as we got older, our family get-togethers, we'd always end the night. They would, the brothers would get together and sing the gospel tunes. Lloyd and and Pinky and my uncle Gary and my dad, and then uh, we had like my aunt Arby was a good uh, piano organ player who could play. Uh, even Barbara uh, could, pl could play the piano, too, I believe, and, and my mom could play the piano. So music was in our family, and we grew up with that foundation of truth, of learning to sing the, the gospel tunes. Jesus was truly our foundation. You know, uh, we all make mistakes in our lives, and, 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 and we still like sports. We like all the other, other stuff, too. We're not uh, religious nuts, but we love the truth of the word, and I know Lloyd still goes, to, goes and uh, still singing. Jeff says Lloyd's still singing. Leads, leads uh, parts yet. It was great, Lloyd. I'm happy, I'm happy you made it. So, good foundation. But my dad also had, was gifted with music with, uh, with uh, a playing trumpet. In fact, one of the guys here, uh, Ralph, said he, when, when they were in high school, my dad and the Kenny Cotwitz group, they went to Northwestern University, <clears throat> and that's where the high school bands would play, and they'd test them. And, and, the, and the, the guy from the, from the Northwestern University's said, who's that guy playing trumpet? And it was, it was my dad. He, he was only a, probably a junior in high school or senior. I don't, I don't know how old he was. And he's, they said they offered him a scholarship at Northwestern, according to Ralph. I never heard this before. Uh, and, but my dad said he turned it down. And then a year later, Denny, and if, I'm sorry if I say my dad. I know he's a brother to some of you. He's an uncle to some of you. He, he's, a, he's a husband to, to this woman down here in the white. <laughs> And, and uh, grandpa and grandmas and all that stuff and, and, and sons and daughters. But anyway, Denny then took up playing the bass within a year. 
All of a sudden, he went from playing trumpet to picking up and learning the bass. And, and all of a sudden, in 1957, a year after they graduated from high school, they flew him out to California to be on the Lawrence Walt Show. Amazing thing for, uh, for just high school kids here in, in West Dallas, Wisconsin, to get flown out to Los Angeles. And that, that's when TV was just kind of just getting started. And, and they got out there and were on that TV show. Uh, what an honor. And then my dad and his guys all were pretty good musicians. And... Uh, his other musicians, Kenny Kotwitz and, and uh, I can't mention all their names. They all played in Milwaukee area here. And then my dad would play seven nights a week a lot of times at the old restaurants. You, you know, they, they didn't have CDs back then. He had live music at restaurants, you know, nice piano player, uh, bass player, singers and guitar players, whatever. And uh, a lot of his buddies went out to California and Las Vegas to uh, where he could make more money playing music. That's when Las Vegas was getting bigger and bigger and bigger in the, in the 60s. Well, my dad, Denny, stayed here because he had four of us kids. By the time him and my mom were 23, they had all four of us kids. Young family. So now, so now my dad was working construction during the day and playing music at night. In fact, uh, some of his brothers said, you ain't going to make it to 30 years old. You're just working way too much trying to work construction and then work at night from 9 o'clock till like 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, tough, uh, but you did what you had to do to make your ends meet for a family, and uh, that's the way it was back then. And, and anybody, you all know what you all went through to uh, to make things work and survive, especially people through out of the 30s, 40s, 50s. All there was always some tough times. So Denny did all that stuff too. He had, and then he went from the jazz music here to polkas, and he got to uh, be play with Frank Yankovic. Uh, well-known national polka artist, and he loved playing with Frank because now he can make just as much money as the jazz guys, but playing a lot less, and he got to travel. They went to Hawaii, they got to go to Alaska, and he had a lot of nice uh, jobs, a lot of nice shows that they could play at with Frank because Frank was well-known, and he made a little bit more money with that, and, uh, and my dad loved it, and Frank loved to have my dad there because my dad could sing harmonies with him from singing back when he was a kid and, and the bass. So it, it was a good thing with, with uh, the whole musical career with my dad, too. And I know a lot of you people know him from the musical career. But he was also, his other life was the construction business, and we got involved in the swimming pool business in 1975. My dad took a job. My dad used to, Danny used to build, uh, used to do driveways and patios, and, and he used to work with his dad, too, and, and his brother Gary, and so that, that was in the family also. But then, in 1975, Banner Builders approached my dad and said, hey, would you like trying to build a swimming pool for us? So my dad was thinking, because I was, we were, me, me and my brother, Barry, we were just uh, teenagers. So my dad was thinking, yeah, I could take this job, and then my sons could do my part. He was thinking for the family. He could get a salary from them, and then we could take over the building part, uh, and we'd make more money for us all. And so he made that move, took that job, and then me and my brother Barry took over the pool business. We were just young kids. You know, I was 19. Barry would be 16, three years younger than me. You know, I was out of high school. Barry still had a year left or so. And we kept that pool business going. And then by, that was 1979. By 1988, we were making it. We bought our place out in Wales. And we we're starting to make enough money now that we said, Dad, come on, come on back. To your, to your company, man. So he came back with us, and he sold a lot of pools. The first year, in 1989, we were still subcontracting for Banner Pools, but my dad, we got my dad out of there because he was going bald. He was, he was a lot of stress on him. So he's, we bought the place in Wales, and he says, Dad, you just cut the lawn out here. Just cut the lawn, and we'll put a little sign up outside and, and uh, swimming pools, and he said, if somebody comes and wants a pool, maybe you sell a pool. So we thought, we thought my dad, Denny, would might sell maybe one or two pools that year. He ended up selling 26 pools, that one little sign. We didn't even have an office. You know, he'd just bring them in, in, the, in the, like, a, like a little kitchen area. And just because his personality, he had that personality. Everybody liked him. He had that natural gift, the natural smile, the, the natural warmth. You know, I, I didn't have that. My mom had that, too. And, and, and a lot of people, I, I was more the quiet one in the family. And here I am speaking now. For my first time. <laughs> well, anyway, so he met a lot of people through the pool business, and all of our pool customers got great testimonies, meeting Denny, my dad, 
they all remember the first time he comes in there and, 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 and how he acted and what he did. And, and uh, they all have uh, great memories of, of all that, too, which is a great thing. So he's got a, he's got a great testimony. And then my dad, you know, he did his own gospel tune, Jesus, our Lord, my King. He did this after his dad died in 1971. And then me and my brother and my dad and Kenny, we, we played it. And I was only, we were only kids. We played that song. But my dad, you just heard it play before he left. He had Mary and Kenny Cotwitz do this song, which you just heard. And it's his own song that he, that he wrote. And uh, Kenny helped with the music. And we continue with those gospel songs. We've done uh, three, four other song, gospel songs, too, that uh, go in the family. And at least it all started back with our grandpa, my dad's dad, who started that foundation in us as we were kids with all of our family. They say all of my uncles and cousins and, and, and all of us together. So it's been a great, a great uh, testimony and a good foundation in us all the way through. So we know the truth, and the truth sets us free. And I'll tell you, my dad... At the end, when you saw him physically, you know, Jesus came. He pays, he conquered death for us, and his blood covers us, through his blood covers our sin for his blood atonement for us. But my dad, he was still in the in his bondage of this body. And, and like in Psalm 116 or throughout the Bible, it says, Jesus also comes to release us from the bondage that we're in. The bondage of sin, but also the bondage of these bodies, this mortal body still gets tired and worn out. You, know, you see me hobbling around, and we all, we all go through issues as you get older. And, and Jesus comes to deliver us, even from these mortal bodies. My Danny, at the end, he couldn't get up. He couldn't go to the bathroom himself. He couldn't do anything on his own. And just to see him look at it with his eyes, or if he fell down, just a, a bad feeling knowing he was so helpless. So Jesus, and we, we have told, I was told my dad, I said, Dad, when Jesus comes here to get you, I said, when he says, Denny, stand up, and let's go. I told, him, I told him, I said, Dad, don't say, oh, Lord, I, I can't stand up. And he said, if he told you to stand up, you stand up. Just like in guys in the Bible, uh, some paralyzed people that Jesus came across, and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then he says, stand up, take your mat with you, and, 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 and go. And these guys who never walked in their life, would just jump up. They didn't just go up slow. They jumped up and they would run out of it. They didn't even walk. They ran. You know, just think of the power that Jesus has to put all that strength back. And they were so happy. One time when Peter and John were with one of those guys, it says he was jumping up and down the whole time they were in the temple. The guy couldn't stop jumping up and down. He was so happy. You know, so I know my dad now, he's free from that bondage of being in that body where he couldn't do nothing. And he never complained. Folks, then he never complained the situation he was in all those tough times in health. He never complained about nothing. We were always amazed how he could be such content, how he could be so content and so happy in the situation he's in. We, we didn't think he would, because normally if you get unhappy and you're not content, you're just going to uh, go sooner. But he stayed content, and that's why I believe the Lord kept him around so long. I, I don't know how he did it, you know, but he, he was thinking of all of his foundation that he had from all his life, and that foundation of truth, uh, and that's another word for Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, is truth, they call themselves truth. The truth stays in us, and it gives us the strength to uh, get by, and uh, he did his time, and now the best is still yet to come, I'm almost done, so don't, don't, don't get me, I hope I'm not boring anybody out here. Uh, the best is yet to come yet, you know, we're, uh, we like music, and, and like the old jazz tunes along with the nice gospel tunes, you know, we grew up with, at my grandpa's house, sorry, when I was a kid, we'd go to Lloyd's, my dad's grandpa, his, his dad's house, and we'd play, uh, he, he and my grandpa had uh, records of uh, Elvis Presley gospel, uh, the Blackwood Brothers, the Stamps Quartet, the Spears, and, and, and all that, so we always loved playing that stuff and, 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 and that. And I forgot where I was going. <laughs> Oh, I want to talk the future. The best is still yet to come. One of my favorite jazz tunes is called The Best is Yet to Come. It's a jazz tune, you know, like Sinatra kind of jazz. If you listen to the words of those songs, it says, out of the tree of life, I just picked me a plum. Now, getting back to the Garden of Eden, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. 
along with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Once Adam and Eve ate out of, ate out of the wrong tree, the knowledge of good and evil, you read in the Bible. The Lord then sent cherubim angels to protect that tree of life. He didn't want Adam and Eve now to eat out of the tree of life once God put the curse on them, which means they're going back to the dust. He didn't want that. To, otherwise, we would all have no future. He guarded that tree of life. The next time you hear about that tree of life is in the new city of Jerusalem. That's the place that Jesus went to prepare for us or the God the Father made. It says in, in John 14, it says, In my Father's house, Jesus says, In my Father's house there are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. The Bible gives us detailed information about this place. It's a city. It's called the New Jerusalem. The Bible gives us the dimensions. 12,000 furlongs wide, which is about 1,500 miles, 1,500 miles long, and it's 1,500 miles high. So 1,500 miles is like two-thirds of the United States, but it's also 1,500 miles high. The you know, airplanes fly at five miles in the air. This city is 1,500 miles high. This place is in heaven. That's where Jesus went to prepare a place for us, which was with the Father from the beginning. He's preparing our house for us in there and everything we need. It's got the streets of pure gold in there. It's got the river of life in there and the tree of life. And if the Bible says that that place is great for every situation, everything you could ever want, it's better than any resort you could find here on earth. That's in heaven. But here's the thing. The Bible tells us when Jesus, now you've got to go back to this plan. He made everything in six days. He rested on the seventh and he blessed it and sanctified it. The Bible also tells us that a thousand years to us is like one day to God the Father. I always point to the north, you know, his throne. I'm not pointing to my dad. I'm pointing. God the Father's throne is up in the north, Psalm 75. That's where his throne is. That's where that city is, out of the north. That's when I get on my knees and pray. I always like to face the north. That city in heaven with the streets of pure gold, the river of life, got everything we're going to need in there. And there's gates, three gates on each side, 12 gates total. That city, when Jesus brings his kingdom back to earth, which is going to happen because man from Adam and Eve, it's only it's been like 6,150 years. We have a little timelines out there. They're free if anybody wants one. It explains the Bible. It's not mine. This is the Bible's information. It tells us how long each guy was until they had their sons, and you could put it all together. And we've only been here from Adam and Eve, 6,150 like years. Jesus was 2,000 years ago. At his time, it was actually the year like 4,000. Man changed it. You know, why do you think we're in the year 2022? They went back to zero after Jesus left because it was such a big event of him conquering death. The whole world knew something powerful just happened. They went, started back at zero. I don't know why. I think it's probably the devil's plan to get people confused so when he can say millions and billions, the people nowadays are going to say, well, yeah, it must be millions and billions, but it's not that long. Just over 6,000 years. Well, that's like six days in the Lord's eyes. So what that means, he's ready for his day of rest again. It's God the Father and Jesus. And the Bible tells us he's going to enjoy this day of rest for the thousand years back here on the earth, which means we're coming back with him. The Bible says we're coming back. All of us who are part of what's called the first resurrection are coming back with Jesus to the earth in our glorified bodies, male and female. All the parts are there, fully male, fully female, because he's still got our connection together forever. That's never going to be taken away. That city, you read in Revelation chapter 20, come 21, comes down out of heaven and comes down to the earth and rests on the earth because Jesus is going to set up his kingdom here on the earth. And the Bible tells us throughout the Psalms and the, even the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. We get to inherit the earth forever. To me, that was exciting. Uh, I never learned that when I went to church as a kid. But when the Lord brought the Bible to my house and started reading it in 1996, he started teaching me these things in his revelation. I love his revelation. You know, that's the only book in the Bible that says that he who reads this book will receive a special blessing. Man, it's, it's so exciting for me to read the Bible. I love the whole thing, but revelation gives us fine details. And actually, the Old Testament gives us a lot of details of what his plan is. Even that city we're talking about. And, and, and clothes that we can wear. We're not just running around in a white sheet. He's got some great clothes for us to wear. I mean, we can wear our jeans, boots, leathers. They're all, they're all mentioned, embroidered work. And we also get to come back with, uh, and there's gates on that city. So we're still going to be able to come on the earth, still build houses on the earth, enjoy ourselves on the earth, because the gates are open all the time. We go in and out. 
But there's going to be people born yet, still in this body when Jesus takes over. If they don't really believe and trust in Jesus, even though they'll see that city, the Bible says they won't be able to get into that city. And the devil then cons them later. But for the thousand years we're back with Jesus, the devil gets shut up in a bottomless pit. He's not there now, folks. He's running around. And there's coming a seven-year great tribulation that could start very soon when the world leader called the Antichrist is going to be revealed. Jesus, it's a seven-year great tribulation. Jesus says where over half the people on earth will get killed. And Jesus said if they wouldn't shorten the days, there'd be no flesh left. But those of us who trust in Jesus, he'll take care of us. Even if you die, you say, well, Jesus, death has no power over him. And us to believe in him, no power over us. We don't have to fear death. He's got us alive. He says precious is the, is the death of his saints in, in Psalm 116. Jesus got us planned. But we're coming back to the earth. To me, that was so exciting. We had another gospel song written called We'll Be Riding White Horses about Jesus coming back to the earth and we're coming back with him. To me, that was so exciting. I said, we're going to get a song written about that. I never heard anybody sing about that. So we had that all done back in the year 2000 with our friends Kenny and Mary Kotlitz again and, and a lot of his top musicians out in California. So anyway, folks, I don't, I don't want to keep going here. I could keep going with a lot of things, but I know everybody wants to get out of here. But uh, I think that's all i got to say. I just want to read you... Let me just check my notes here. I just want to read you my dad's... The words of the song. If they're back to you, you guys can get the words of the song, but I want to finish up with... Ruthie, can, can you read this? Hey, you did great. Oh, I'm just myself, man. You're so not great. A, not a fan. So this is the sentiment on the inside of the CD that my dad wrote, and it's just so touching. It says, this song was written to give honor to our Lord Jesus Christ, who has the authority over life and death. Through faith in him, we can have full assurance to live eternally and enjoy life abundantly. For those who have gone before us and those who shall follow, trust in the word of God. For one of these days, he's coming for you also. Denny. And at the very bottom it says, This song was inspired by the passing of my dad, Lloyd M. Bonick, whose feet were the same size as mine, but whose shoes I could never fill. So, very sweet. Excellent job, Brett. Thank you.